Okay, hi everyone. Hi. So, my name's Avinash, just in case any of you didn't catch that. And today I'll be introducing our speaker. So our speaker is, the name of our speaker is Mr. Yusuf Ibrahim. Hashim. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Yusuf Hashim. So, Mr. Yusuf Hashim retired in 1999 as a managing director in the chemicals industry and a retail marketing manager in the oil and gas industry. However, he, after that, he became a volunteer photographer for WorldExplorer.net. And WorldExplorer.net is an organization that takes photographers all around the world using motorcycles and 4x4s over mountain ranges, over deserts, and so on. He has made the trip from Istanbul to Malaysia, and Malaysia to London countless times. He's traveled many of the world's deserts, like the Kalahari, the Gobi, and other deserts, as well as mountain <laughs> ranges, <laughs> such as mountains, such as the Alps and the Himalayas. He has uh, intense passion for, for photography. His expertise in photography is such that he was a part-time lecturer in Open University of Malaysia for the diploma students in photography. He's also the administrator for photomalaysia.com, which is Malaysia's biggest group of photography enthusiasts with over 100,000 members. With that, I'll pass the mic to him to continue his speech. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let's see. Where do we begin? Okay, that's the uh, Sahara Desert. I, was, I shot this picture with one hand on the steering wheel and the other hand holding my camera through the windscreen of my truck. We were on a 60-day expedition to cross the Sahara Desert from, uh, from uh, uh, Khartoum to Egypt through Libya, to Algeria, to Tunisia, over the Atlas Mountains, into uh, Morocco, and from Casablanca, we sent our cars back. I don't think uh, anybody else has ever done that before. I mean, Malaysians, I mean, you know. So uh, we were not in the Guinness Book of Records because that is only for people who build the longest sausages, you know, <laughs> the biggest pizza. So our, you know, our achievement is really quite small. But anyway, um, in 1999, no, 2001, I think I can remember now, we shipped our cars to Khartoum, and from there, we drove all the way across Egypt to Cairo, then across uh, the southern Libya to Tripoli, then across uh, the Tunisian Sahara over the Atlas Mountains into Morocco, okay? So that was uh, one of the earliest things that I, I did. Uh, but let me introduce myself first. <laughs> okay, my name is Yusuf Hashim. <laughs> and I'm uh, 73 years old, uh, grandfather of 15 grandchildren. Yeah. I worked in Shell for 30 years, uh, together with Kamarol and uh, a few other people working in, uh, in Kazana now. But I retired 20 years ago in 1999. So. I'm from the previous century. <laughs> uh, I was the retail marketing director before I retired from Shell. And then before that, I was the managing director for Shell Chemicals. And uh, before that, I was working in London and in Rotterdam as the international trading manager for Styrenix. I mean, for the chem case, chemists amongst you, styrenes are the ones that's causing all the damage to the earth these days. Okay. Uh, presently, I'm a gentleman of leisure, <laughs> an unconventional traveler. I pride myself at being a photographer, and all the pictures that I'm going to show you were shot by myself. I write for a few magazines. I've written a few books as well. And I'm a jib setter. A jib setter is a portmanteau word. Portmanteau meaning a 
it joins two words together, like uh, Brexit, Britain and exit, or brunch, uh, breakfast and lunch. So gypsy, gypsetting is actually a portmanteau word which joins the meaning of traveling like a gypsy, going to places like gypsy likes, or knows only uh, by gypsies, and wanting the comforts of a jet setter. <laughs> okay, so that's what a gypsetter is. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk to you today, uh, about five points, uh, I'm going to talk to you about legacy, about leadership, about uh, life and the stages of life, the challenges of each stage of life, and how to live life to the fullest. Okay? Let's begin with legacy. 50 years ago, uh, my generation inherited this country and this world. That time, Malaysia was a nation of rubber planters, rubber tappers, tin miners, shopkeepers, Kampong Malays, planting rice. We had no industries to talk about. So over the last 50 years, my generation has built Malaysia to what it is today. We ushered in the industrial revolution for Malaysia, the electronic revolution. We uh, built this country, we built new colleges and all that. But we also left behind a legacy of bad things, okay? We left behind plastics, which is causing, uh, you know, almost irre irreparable damage to this, uh, to this earth, okay? Uh, in this country, for example, we brought about, we left behind, uh, I would say, interracial tension, when during my time there was none. We left behind a, or rather we, we, we created a terrible education system. That is why all of you are going abroad. Okay? <laughs> and then we had many, many other problems. I mean, we are known as a kleptocracy. Okay? Our ex-Prime Minister is being charged in court. What I'm trying to tell you is that this is a legacy that we left behind for you. With the benefit of hindsight, 2020 hindsight, I can see all this. So now, you, I see in you what I was 50 years ago. You are about to take the reins of leadership from my generation. Okay? So, what are you going to leave behind 50 years from today? Therein lies the secret of leadership. Leadership is all about visioning about seeing the future, about looking at a place that you want to get to and getting there by inspiring people, motivating people, building a team. You see your passion and your, you know, and your effort and your thinking capacity to get to where you want to be. So, as I told you, when we came to this country, when I came or we took over this country from our elders, we had a nation of rubber tappers and tin miners. You've got a nation of what it is today. Where do you, as our future leaders, where are you going to take this nation? That is the vision that you have to create. And in 50 years' time, when you stand here and talk to the other kids who's going to come after you, what are you going to say? What have you left behind? Okay? That's what I mean by leadership and legacy. Then, life is a series of stages or passages. I'm going to talk about those and the challenges of each. But let's begin from the bottom, how to live life to the fullest. Yes, that's the best part of it. Yeah? The rest are all very boring. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the Watnojoku ice cap. That's one of the cars that we use to cross the ice cap. It's the biggest ice cap in, uh, in Iceland, in, in Europe, basically, about 400 kilometers across. Uh, that's yours truly when I was a little bit younger, when my hair was a little bit black. <laughs> And we were crossing the Atacama Desert. That's the Sala de Uyuni, the uh, lake bed of an ancient lake. Uh, it's very, very beautiful. Yeah. We were then on a trip trying to drive around South America from Buenos Aires back to Buenos Aires. And that's the um, Ruta 40, the world's longest, loneliest road. 6,000 kilometers. At 1,000 1, kilometer stretch, uh, when we were driving, we only noticed three other cars or trucks and two of them were broken down. <laughs> so that's how lonely it is, okay? Uh, this is the Makgadik Gadik. 
pans. It's also the ancient lake bed, uh, uh, the lake bed of an ancient uh, lake. Uh, you have three other places like this in the world. One is the Sala di Uyuni, uh, which is also an ancient uh, lake bed. And the other one is, most of you might know it, the salt flats of Utah. So it's the same, you know, there are three of them. So one of your um, bucket lists should be to try and visit all three. I've done all three, but I'm 76, 73 years old. So you still have time. Uh, that's what it looks like when you're crossing the Sahara Desert. Yeah. That's the Sahara Desert of Libya, uh, of Algeria. And that's the Danakil Hilton. <laughs> uh, we stayed here on the way to climb uh, Mount Erta Ali, which is uh, Africa's most active volcano. Uh, that's, uh, there, is a, there is a tribe of uh, local people who live there called the Afas. They've been mining salt for the last 400 years and sending it out on uh, trains of donkeys and camels, sometimes 1,000 animals long. So I mean to see this is really out of this world. But BBC did a commentary on, on this place and they call it the cruelest place on earth. Why? Because in the daytime, temperatures are 55 Celsius. In the nighttime, it's 48. So you can only climb this thing at night. So we go to that place where I sit just now, we put our things there, and then we walk from there and climb up. Yeah. Uh, that's El Ta'ale. We camped right on the rim. We walked up about 7 o'clock in the evening. We reached the summit around about 11, slept for about two hours, took out our cameras, took those pictures, and then before the sun comes up, by about 3.30, 4 o'clock, we walk down again. Okay. The lava gets blown up about 30 meters or so, and you can't you can't you can't sleep on the ground. You've got to have stakes, four stakes with the platform, and you sleep on it. Okay. Beautiful sight. You must make it a point to go. I've climbed uh, before this. I climbed Mount Bromo, Mount Ejen, uh, Dalol volcano. So four volcanoes during a period of three weeks. Okay. That's what it looks like. You know. Uh, this is the uh, Skogafoss uh, waterfall in uh, Iceland in winter. So, uh, that's yours truly uh, taking pictures of uh, penguins in the Falklands. I just want to show you the, the, uh, the, uh, the routes that I've driven uh, over the last 15, 20 years since I retired. Um, she mentioned rightly that I, when I retired, in 1999, I joined a group of friends um, who are uh, rich boys with big toys. They've got, uh, <laughs> they've got uh, land cruisers, and their aim in life is to drive across every continent, across every country in the world. And I joined them. I said, OK, I don't have any money to buy a land cruiser. Let me be one of your spare drivers, and I will take pictures for you for free. So I went on the first trip. I paid for my own fare. And I gave them the pictures. They liked the pictures so much so that they appointed me as their permanent, unpaid, <laughs> official <laughs> photographer. But it doesn't matter because I get to see all the world. Yeah? I got to travel with them through 130 countries across every continent. So just now I mentioned to you that uh, I crossed uh, the Sahara from Khartoum to, uh, to uh, Casablanca. But uh, over a period of what, three and a half months, four months, uh, we drove from Cape Town right up to through Mombasa, Khartoum, to Cairo, and then the, uh, across the Sahara Desert on another occasion, the one that I showed you like just now. Okay. Uh, South America, in 2006, uh, we shipped our cars to Buenos Aires and drove all the way around South America through, uh, through uh, Uruguay, Brazil, Paraguay, um, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, down south to Ushuaia, and then drove up back again to Buenos Aires, about three and a half months, and shipped the car back. Um, I just want to show you some of the routes I've driven. Uh, this is not bragging, but to inspire you to, not seriously, to inspire you that if you have a dream, 
if you want to have, a, if you, you have it in your heart to go and see the world and you want to drive around the world, it can happen. It's just how bad you want it to happen. Yeah? So in uh, 2002, I think, I can't remember now, we shipped our cars to Istanbul and drove back home to Petaling Jaya along the old Silk Road, passing Turkey, Iran. <clears throat> After Iran, we went to uh, Pakistan. Pakistan that time, uh, we had no 9-11, so we went to Afghanistan through the Karakoram uh, Highway, over the Hindu Kush, the Palmares and the Himalayas, into the Taklimakan Desert of Xinjiang Uyghur, then cross uh, China, uh, came down to uh, Xi'an, Kunming, Laos, Thailand, back to Malaysia. Yeah, it was such a nice experience that we were having Teh Tarik with my friends in uh, Kana Coffee House. Then we said, why don't we go and drive to India next week? <laughs> so we went. It took us about 30 days to reach India. So we just drove over Thailand, over you know, Laos, China, down the uh, Yang Si Kiang, uh, Valley, into Tibet, down into the Himalayas, over the Lalung La Pass, which is the highest motorable pass in the world, at about 5,800 meters, and then into uh, Nepal, India, Chai, uh, Chennai, and then we ship the car back to Port Lang. It can be done, no issue. Then we shipped our cars to London, and we took a northern route across Europe, across Russia, Belarus, Poland, Kazakhstan, China, back to Petaling Jaya. <laughs> and next year, we say, okay, that was a nice route. Why don't we go a south route? So we shipped our cars. Uh, to London again, and we drove from London <coughs> into <coughs> France, into the Alps, over the Alps, down the Simplon Pass into Italy, across the Adriatic, into Greece, Istanbul, Iran, Pakistan, Pakistan into India, over the Himalayas into Nepal, Tibet, and back. Okay? So much fun. When I was working, I, was, I took my bike and rode from Aceh to Jakarta, Jakarta to Bali, Bali to Makassar, Makassar to Manado by bike. Yeah. And there have been many other smaller trips, you know, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Bangladesh, Borneo, Philippines. Those are minor ones, as I, as I, I call them. And uh, we also covered Af most of Africa. So now, after having done all of the continents on land, there's only the other continent that's left, which is Antarctica. So how to get to Antarctica? We started with the North Pole first. I chartered a ship, a small ship, wooden ship, and sailed to the North Pole. Yeah? We started from Iceland. From Iceland, we sailed to, uh, sailed to uh, Greenland, stayed in Greenland for a couple of weeks. And then went on to Svalbard. Svalbard went up to the North Pole, but we got stopped about 800 kilometers from the North Pole because there was pack ice. I will show you some pictures that I shot during this nice journey. And that's my ship, nine people. And then after doing the North Pole, the last continent, which is Antarctica. So we went to Ushawea, sailed across the Drake's Passage, which is one of the most vicious oceans in the world. Captain Cook, when he was uh, exploring that area, also got sick <laughs> because the waves are about 40 to 50 meters high. Okay. So then <clears throat> I will now show you a few pictures from some of this expedition just to get your, your, your adrenaline going so that you have this urge in you to one day, you know, go. Because life should be, li should be lived. You know, you don't, you don't retire and read newspapers and the obituaries and, you know, <laughs> and volunteered to be your grandson's uh, bus driver to school. You know, those, that's what a typical retiree would do. Or worse still, upon retirement, most people will get another job. Uh, that is something that you have to avoid. What you have to do at your age now, and I'm going to tell you uh, later on about the stages of life and what you have to do during each stage to prepare for the next stage. Yeah? If you want to have a good retirement, where you can do what you like or what you can, what you've been always wanting to do to achieve all the 
items in your bu bucket list. During the work phase of your life, you have to be smart. You have to set aside some money, save, set up a good investment portfolio so that when you retire, you can do all sorts of things that you've always been wanting to do. You need a bit of money, of course. Okay, okay let's see some. Ah, that's the picture of my little wooden ship. Nine people can, st uh, can stay in it. That's what it looks like. And that's an iceberg just to give you a, a sense of scale of what it is. Uh, I've also done the Everest Base Camp when I was 68. Yeah, I tracked to the Everest Base Camp and there was a picture before we reached. I've also done the Annapurna Circuit at 68 years old. <laughs> uh, that's what it looks like on the Annapurna Circuit. Yeah. You want to do that? Very easy. Just go out to Nepal and walk up. <laughs> Seriously. It's, it's, it's nothing. You just must get yourself to Nepal, find out what you need to do. You don't have to spend much. A uh, uh, Nepali porter costs only 25 US dollars a day. So when I went up there, you know, he carries everything. So I want to take a picture, camera, give him back, back. And I walk. Tower, he gives me the tower. <laughs> Water, he gives back to him. So it's a walk in the park. You can do it. If a 68-year-old grandfather of 15 can do, so can you. <laughs> and this is Mount Fitzroy. <laughs> the, the thing is to have the passion in you, you know, the, the will and the determination to go into it. This is uh, Mount Fitzroy. You know, every year, um, about 50,000, 40,000 people attempt to climb Mount Everest. Maybe 1,000 succeed in climbing the summit of Mount Everest, which is the world's highest mountain. Mount Fitzroy is only about 4,000 meters. Every year, about 500 people try to climb this mountain because it's a technical challenge, you know. They use, uh, they make, you know, um, they drive uh, pitons into the granite and they climb by rope. And halfway, they will sleep in a hammock. So every year, about 400 people try, only two succeed and about 15 die every year. And that's the challenge of this. But for people like me, we just trek to the bottom of Mount Fitzroy and take pictures like this. You must go in autumn, when Patagonia and uh, the Mount Fitzroy area, El Calafate, El Charlton, is at its most beautiful. And when you're a photographer, you, you take pictures at the golden hour, when the sun is hor horizontal on the, on, on, on the horizon, and it lights up the mountains like, you know, like a side light. And you get this kind of pictures. Uh, this is the Monaco brand uh, glacier in Spitsbergen. Uh, that's the ship that I charted. This one was for about 24, 25 people to go to the North Pole. And uh, uh, that's a typical iceberg in Antarctica. Antarctica has got huge icebergs. You know? The last uh, iceberg that carved off Antarctica was about the size of whales. Yeah? It's about 200 kilometers wide. And the, the, <coughs> the attraction of Antarctica is the wildlife there, you know. You go there, ah, they say that if you drink ice, iceberg melt, you're bound or you, you will come back to Antarctica. I've been to Antarctica four times. <laughs> and this January, I'm going again. <laughs> you want to come? You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's what we go to uh, the North Pole for, you know, to shoot pictures of polar bears. You know, polar bears live on, on ice packs and then they hunt seals. You know? They hunt seals and they eat seals. And today, the polar bear is a very endangered animal. There's something like 22,000 polar bears left in the world. And uh, all the countries abutting the Arctic Ocean has banned the killing of polar bears, except the United States and Canada. They are killing, for sport, 750 polar bears every year. At this rate of depletion, by the year 2025, 2028, my friend, a very famous uh, deputy director of the Russian Institute for Polar Bear Research, says polar bear will be extinct by 2030. And the Americans are still killing them for sport. Yeah? The polar bear is a beautiful animal. 
that's a whale breaching in, in Antarctica. And we're just about 10 meters away from them. You know? they are, what they do is they send up their air from their um, blowhole and hurt all the krill. Krill is a little udang, you know? And then they'll come from the bottom and open their mouth and boom, like that. And we're just about 10 meters away. Yeah. So uh, the beauty about that is that the whale will never come under your boat. But you dare do that? Of course you can. You know, nobody has been killed. One or twice they do come under your boat by mistake. But no worries. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a walrus. You know, and the, the task there is about a meter and a half long. That's yours truly shooting pictures of Adelie penguins in Antarctica, yeah, in Falklands. Uh, who says penguins cannot fly? And do you know that there are only penguins can only be found in the southern hemisphere. There are no penguins around the North Pole, and polar bears can only be found in the Arctic, and there are no polar bears in the South Pole. Yeah. Uh, that's the aurora borealis in uh, in uh, Iceland. Another picture of the Aurora Borealis in Greenland and that's taken from the deck of my little boat and that's in Iceland as well. Uh, this is the Perito Moreno Glacier uh, in Patagonia in the Los Nationalis uh, Glaciaris National Park. One of the most beautiful places in the world. You have to go there one of these days. Yeah. So over the last 20 years of my retirement. I've been to 130 countries or so, driven, driven across every continent and taking pictures like this. So, uh, what else do we have? Ah, that's a sample of what it's like to cross the Drake's Passage, the world's most vicious ocean. Yeah? The waves are about 30, 40 meters. Uh, this January I'm going. If you want to come, I still can take one or two more. <laughs> And that was shot in Africa last month during the wildebeest migration. Yeah. Haina from Masai Mara. That's a zebra. That's a uh, vevet monkey. Their eyes, you know. If you look closer, you can see my reflection in the eyes. <laughs> uh, that's a lion doing what lions do best. <laughs> you know, they can do it seven times in one hour. <laughs> and yet lions are almost extinct. <laughs> uh, that's what it's like when the a million wildebeest cross the Masai Mara, the Mara River in their annual migration. I went there last month, especially to shoot these pictures. Uh, that's a Suri tribe in Ethiopia. You know, in Ethiopia there are about 30, uh, 30 to 40 tribes which have just been discovered about 40, 50 years ago. They still live like what their ancestors live. And uh, they survive on their cows. And they don't eat them for meat. They drink the blood of the cow and the milk of the cow. But when a cow has a calf, the milk that it produces is only half of what it normally produces. So the Suri um, showed me how you can increase the flow of milk from a cow with a baby cow. Yeah? So they, they, they milk the thing. On normal circumstances, you get one, one pail. But when the cow has got a calf, they have only half a pail. So to get a full pail, you have to do this. It's a scientific fact, you know, because in Australia, they don't put their face in the cow's backside. They actually use compressed air. Okay? So it's, it's, it works. I've seen it work. Yeah? But the cow is regarded as a, as a clean animal. Nothing is dirty about the cow. They use ash, they mix it with cow dung, and they use it as a decoration, paint their body and all that. Say again? <laughs> you dare kiss her after that? <laughs> no. You see, this is the beauty about, about traveling. Travel broadens the minds, you know. Travels let you see people around the world living their own lives. They have got different religion, different colors. They don't wear clothes. You know, they worship different gods. They speak different languages. But they have exactly the same needs and wants like you. They want food, they want shelter, they want, uh, they want a better future for their children, they want happiness, they want love, they want a better life. So why do we have so much interracial animosity? 
everyone is the same. They want the same things. Why should one particular group be special? Yeah. So you have to travel the world. You see people living like this, and then you realize everybody is the same. Yeah. So there should not be any of this kind of I'm superior and you are inferior, that kind of thing. You know? They all want the same things. OK. I just want to touch a little bit on uh, looking at the time. Uh, on the stages of life, that was about living life to the fullest. So if you want to do that, what you have to do is you have to prepare for yourself. During the work phase of your life, you have to save a little bit, work smart. Don't just go to work at 7.30 in the morning and come back 8 o'clock at night. Devote all your life to your employer. When the time comes for you to retire, they give you a bunch of money, they say go. You should set aside a certain amount of time during your work life to plan for the future by building, by saving, by building a small investment portfolio so that when you retire, you can do the things that you've always wanted to do. Okay? But if you don't do that, then you become a cliché retiree. All you do is look after, play golf on a Wednesday, nine holes, you know, read the newspapers, that kind of thing. Okay, living life to the fullest. Leadership. Okay. I just want to talk a few minutes, maybe five or ten slides about leadership. Because you guys are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, I just want to talk about what kind of leaders uh, you can be. Uh, whether leadership is something that you're born with or you can learn. I think leadership can be learned. And I think they've done surveys and they have, uh, uh, they have found that uh, only one third of people are born as leaders. The other two thirds learn to be leaders. So what is the definition of leadership? I've always said that, or I've always thought that the way to define something is to say what it is not, okay? Look around you in our country today. Look at the leaders who've been leading us the last, the last uh, 20 years, 10 years, 15 years. That's the kind of people that you don't want to be, okay? You don't want to be leaders who are corrupt, who are inefficient, who think only of themselves, who are selfish. The bedrock of leadership is honor, integ integrity, morality, that sort of thing, okay? So the first thing about leadership is that I've already mentioned what bad leaders are. You don't want to be like them. You want to be good leaders. Now, let, uh, I'll tell you what kind of, uh, what kind of tools you have to, to, to become good leaders. The first, uh, the skills for leadership, as I said, one third can be, can be uh, uh, two thirds can be learned, uh, 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 are learned, whereas only one third uh, are born. You know? So it's still possible to, to learn to be leaders. The bedrock of leadership is actually integrity, honesty, and morality. If you don't have this, you become to a, part, a position of you come to a position of leadership, you will become a bad leader. Yeah. So remember, honesty, morality, integrity and honor, okay? I've already said just now, a leader is somebody who has a vision. I said to you just now at the beginning of the talk that when we inherited the country 50 years ago and became leaders of, of the country and the world, we gave a lot of bad things to the world. Now you inherit this thing from me, from us, from my generation. What are you going to give to the world from 50 years from today? What are you going to leave? for your children. That's the essential quality of a leader. The ability to visualize the future, to have a vision. Mate is a good leader, why? Because 20 years ago he says, I want Malaysia to be this, that and the other in 2020. Okay, so he has a vision where he wants to go, where he wants to take. So you as leaders, you must have a vision where you want to take your company if you're a manager of a company. Where you want to take your country if you become a prime minister of the country? Where you want to take your community if you become a, a leader of your community? So you must have a vision, you must have a target, and then you must also have the, uh, the, the ability to inspire people to follow you. So leaders are actually agents of change. Yeah? They don't just accept things as they are. They see a, a, a better future and they can take their team, their group, their followers, to a better future, so they're agents of change. Uh, you must also have communication skills because in order to persuade people to follow you, 
you must be able to articulate your vision. Yeah? You must uh, be able to say why it is that in the year 2020, we must be this, that, or the other. Or why is it that when you're leading the company, we have to change direction from being a normal producer, or whatever it is, we go to another area. But look at people like uh, Jack Ma, for example. You know, Jack Ma was rejected by all the, by Harvard, actually, you know. And he said, he said that uh, while you guys were talking about payment systems, I was doing it. And now he's built Ali, Alipay. He's now the richest person in China and the third richest person in the world. And that's a leader. A leader does. He has a vision. He has a passion. And he becomes an agent of change. Uh, a leader must be able to motivate and inspire your followers. Uh, you have to be able to coach people. Yeah? Um, you have to be skilled at building teams and I can I'll speak a little bit about how you can uh, have this skill. Uh, we call it uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, you must have a little bit of appetite for risk taking. You, know, you just don't become a follower and sit down there, oh, cannot do that because I could this, I could that. If you don't venture out, you will never succeed. And failure is the best teacher for whatever you want to learn, yeah? Because experience, once you get experience, you never make the same mistake again. So vision, the ability to motivate and to inspire, and emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is the ability to, uh, to uh, recognize, understand, and manage emotions. Not only the emotions, your own emotions, yeah? your feeling of anger, your feeling of anxiety and all that, but you must also be able to recognize in the people that you lead this kind of feelings of inadequacy, of fear, where you can then use your, 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 your skills to work into his emotions and persuade him to go the direction that you want to go. Okay? So you must also be able to recognize emotions in others, as I said. Not only yourself, but also in others. And then use that to adjust and adapt to the environment to achieve the goals that you're going to set for your organization. Okay? That's called emotional intelligence. And that's repeating the same thing. You must have sensitivity to see what uh, are bothering people. You must have empathy to be able to relate uh, to his fears, to his anxieties. Uh, you must also control your own anger, your own, own anxieties, your own emotions. So self-awareness and uh, uh, self-regulation and skills, social skills and uh, motivators. Those are some of the, I have to go quickly because I have very short time. So what are leaders? Uh, leaders turn vision into reality. Yeah? They are people who initiate and lead movements for change. That's what you have to be. You, know? you just don't sit down there in your office and you know, when you become in your work life later on and just do things. You have to think of new things, of where do you want to take your organization, how to do it, how to influence people to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to follow you. So you have to engage with them explain to them, motivate them, inspire them to be a part of something that's bigger than what it is presently. Yeah? Remember, leaders are agents of change. and You have to initiate the change and you have to coach people, your followers, to go to the direction that you, that you have, uh, you have uh, determined. So leaders know teams can accomplish more than individuals. Um, if you work alone, you can never get things done, but if you the sum of the effort of a whole team can, uh, can uh, get things, things done very quickly. So leadership styles. There are about seven or eight leadership styles you know, that you can use. Uh, some of these you can learn, others you can observe. Um, if you look at the first one, uh, participative and, uh, and democracy, where you ask for people's opinions, you know, and then you discuss, and then you you get to a direction that you want to go. But they've always said that if you put a committee to design a, a horse, you get a camel. Sometimes you have to have democracy and uh, participative, but then you have also got to take charge. Okay? So then you have the autocratic and authoritarian type of leaders, people who order things. You know, say, okay, do this, you know, do that, don't do this, don't do that. 
Uh, that's the autocratic type, you know. And then you've got the bureaucratic type where there is a structure, like government, for example. They've got structures. They cannot do certain things because they have to follow this, this structure. Sometimes that works. Sometimes not. Most times not. And then you've got the coercive style where you threaten the guy, you know. You say threaten your team. You lead by force and by fear. And then you've got coaching where, you know, you, you teach the guy, you guide the guy to get to the direction that you want him to go. And then you have the affiliative where you lead through relationships. You know? I mean, I'm your friend, you know, let's go together down that direction. Whatever it takes to get them to go to the area, to the, area that, to the direction that you want them to go. And then there is the charismatic and the pace-setting uh, pace leader who leads by example, by actually getting their hands dirty and, and doing it themselves. Yeah? Then there is the visionary uh, leader who is always focused in the future. You know? Uh, that's the uh, kind of leader that is very difficult to come by. Uh, people with vision, with the uh, ability to foresee the future and to take people or the team in the direction where they want them to go. And then there's a the laser fair where you know you leave them there, let them do, sign the task. Okay, you, I mean, go and sell 50,000 barrels of oil or whatever. Go and do it. I don't care how you do it. Yeah? And then you can then use the the coercive type of that, reward and punishment. If you achieve that, I give you a, a raise. If you don't, I cut your salary, that kind of thing, you know. So there are many, many styles, but the, that's called the transactional, you know. I give you a target, you achieve, I give you a bonus. You don't achieve, I cut your salary. That's transactional. So you see, you can combine all these all this, uh, ways of leading people into a suitable way to get things done. I like PES, transformational leadership. What is transformational leadership? Uh, transformational leaders are people who attract, affect other people's emotions by, by painting a big picture of the future and getting them, getting buy-in from them to go to the direction that you want them to go. Okay? Uh, you can inspire people to follow you, you know, by, by your ideas, by your passion, by your uh, by your own actions, especially, you know. And then you can, you have to create an environment for intellectual stimulation, you know. I mean, give them opportunities to learn. Let them come up with ideas. Let them suggest things, you know, so that if it is part of it is their own idea, then it is very easy to get buy-in and they are more committed to following you. Uh, making people uh, accept ownership and wanting to succeed is one of the most powerful uh, methods of getting things done. Okay, so leadership styles. Uh, if you draw a graph and put uh, concern for production on one side and concern for people on the other end, so you find many types of leaders from here. Uh, if you force people all the time without concern for for people, like uh, you know when the Japanese built the death railway in Burma, you know, force, 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 whatever it is. Get the railway done, otherwise I kill you, you know, that kind of thing. That's 9-1 uh, leadership on the concern for production, absolutely no concern for the people. And then the other end is uh, too much concern for people, no concern for production, you know. All the time, you know, never mind, like, you sick, okay, don't go, I mean, don't try, never mind, it's dangerous for you, that sort of thing. And then there is also the, the government type of leaders, impoverished style, where, you know, there's no concern for production, no concern for people, only concerned for following procedures. You know? So the middling style is uh, the middle of the road where it's a five-five, you know, five points for concern for people, five points for concern for production. But the best is, of course, the nine-nine situation where you build teams, there's a big concern for people, good concern for people, and also a very respectable concern for production. That's the best kind of leadership style. And to do this, as I said, you have to combine all the styles of leadership and see which works depending on the situation. Okay. So what type of leader do you want to be? Yeah. Um, I already said the basic bedrock of leadership is integrity, morality and honesty. If you don't have this, you always end up a, big, uh, a bad leader. So you apply situational leadership. You look at the situation and you apply all the, the skills that you've got. Use a mixture of the 
leadership styles that I mentioned to you just now to get things done. And then um, you can be autocratic and, uh, and uh, coercive and transactional when necessary. Or you can be participative to motivate people. Or you can be bureaucratic when making policy decisions. And you can be transformational uh, when your team is strong and, uh, and uh, ex experienced and energized. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit more about, uh, about the stages of life I mentioned. You know, the average lifespan of a Malaysian male is actually 76 years. If this line represents your age, okay, you get born, okay, and you die at 76. That's the average lifespan of a Malaysian male. I'm 73, so I've got three more years to live, on average. <laughs> but, Tom Mate is 93, yeah? So people can live to 93. But for the average to be 90, uh, 76, some of my friends have died at 60. Yeah, so average. So work on the average that life will end by 76. So based on that, I will um, describe to you the stages of life, okay? The, the time of death may be longer or shorter or earlier or later. I mean, uh, you get born, you... Uh, you have an education, it takes on average about 23 years to get through college, you know, 23, maybe 25 for people who do medicine, that kind of thing, you know. But you graduate at around 23. And when you graduate, what do you do? You get a job, you, know? you get married, you get kids, you get a mortgage, yeah. <laughs> and normal things that married people, and you know, that's what you're gonna be you know, when you graduate. You know? Then you have another child, but it takes 23 years on average for each child to be educated because now education is the most expensive thing apart from buying a house in your life. You know? Everybody wants to send their kids uh, to a better university abroad because the universities in, in Malaysia, number one, for some sections of the community is unavailable and for others, they just cannot uh, enter. You know? So uh, they go abroad. So some of you might want to send your kids abroad and the reason why you are going abroad is your the creme de la creme, you know, so you owe it to society to give back when you come back. So, it takes 23 years. So, your first child, if you have a child at 26, yeah, plus um, 23 at 40, 49, your first child graduates. Yeah, I have four children and my last daughter graduated at 53. Uh, that was the signal for me to retire. I retired at 53. Okay, those days during my time, the retirement age was 55. So I retired two years before time. Uh, voluntary, because there was a, in the late 90s, uh, everybody was downsizing, right sizing, you know, um, whatever. And then they dangled a big pile of money in front of me and said, hey, would you like to go? I said, yeah, of course. I took the money and I went <laughs> because I had only 17 months left to work and the package they gave me was worth about 21 months in 1999, which was a tax-free year. What you, what you pay now as tax is in advance, you know, you, what you pay as you earn. But those days, what we earned last year, we pay next year, you see. So in 1999, whatever I got, in the year 2000, I don't have to pay tax because they changed the system to paying tax in, in advance. So that was a big... Uh, <laughs> incentive for me to go, you know. So anyway, so uh, if you work, normally these days people retire at 65. So if you look at it as a percentage of your life, uh, for working 42 years, uh, you, you work 55% of your life. And you take 30% of your life to get a degree, which leaves you only 15% for retirement. Okay, that's with the benefit of 2020 review vision. You are still young, you know, you're all on this uh, threshold of getting to work and you're all excited about getting to work, getting a job and that kind of thing. But looking back, you know, if you look at it coldly, if you die at 76 on average and if you retire at 65, you have only 11 years. What happens at 70 if you have a heart attack? Yeah. So. Many of my friends 
70 years old, usually professionals like doctors, lawyers, accountants, you know, they just don't know how to retire. They will work and they will work and they will work. And the day that they will die, the day before, they are still, okay, they are, they are, they are still uh, at their job. Okay, I don't have uh, any more time. So anyway, I'll just go through quickly. So um, implications of retiring at, uh, at uh, uh, a late age is that, you know, you, you have less uh, time to spend when you retire. Uh, if you have a heart attack, then that time is cut even more. So retire early. My, my advice to you is, you know, okay, as soon as you finish graduation, take one year off and go and see the world before you get a mortgage and that sort of thing, you know, just travel a bit, you know, work, travel, work, travel, and then really come back and, and, and work properly and get married. And then retire as early as possible, not later than 60. And during the phase that you are working, you should, uh, you should plan on, uh, on, on saving and creating a, a robust investment package so that you can do what, what you want to do when you retire, okay? So anyway, um, I've already spoken about cliche retirees. Yeah. Okay. Don't just drift into retirement like what m most people do. So I retired at 53 and I spent uh, the last 20 years traveling the world, living life to the fullest. And uh, my father, my mother, my sisters, my brothers all lived till 85. So I have another, I hope. <laughs> so if you look at the scale of the thing, eh, 32 years to age 85, and I'll be having fun for 38% of my life. The message about working long period of time is that you're going to spend 55% of your life working. If your job doesn't suit you, if you're unhappy at work, for God's sake, leave. Find a better job. Okay, don't just hang in there. Okay, I think I will stop there. I've got uh, a few takeaways that I want to give you, but time is, uh, is short. So, what I said just now. The world is a wonderful place. <laughs> Go out there and see it for yourself. Okay. Leadership can be learned, work hard, work smart, save and invest during the work phase of your life. Don't just work until 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, only taking care of your company's uh, interests and forgetting your own interests. Yeah. Start to think of doing something for yourself as well while you're working. So target to retire as early as possible and the bedrock of leadership. That's what I said it is. I've got many more slides, but I will stop there. All right. Everyone enjoyed the speech? Yes. I particularly enjoyed the one year sabbatical idea. Hopefully, YK can give. La. <laughs> so, to summarize, I think the key takeaways from Mr. Yusuf's speech is that in life, we have to be able to, while we must do our work and we will have a career in the future, we must also bear in mind what are our passions and we should always make sure that our life is not just work, but we must live a life worth living. La. So, I'm not going to take too much of the time, so we'll open up the floors to questions. Hello, Mr. Yusuf. My name is Aishwarya. Um, your speech was amazing. Totally mind blown right now. <laughs> um, my question is, how did you find a right group of people for you to travel with? Did it take you like a long time to find the right people? Because you guys need to be sharing the same visions of what you are, what you are about to do at these places, how you're going to go about it, stuff like that. So how did you find your people? While I was working um, in the 90s, 1991, I bought myself a super bike, a 1100cc bike. And uh, we got seven people together and we started what we call the Super Bikers Club of Malaysia. The aim of the club was to go and ride our bikes to China, 
to India, to Cambodia, to Vietnam. So while I was working, you know, on the weekends, I used to write to, uh, to Hat Nai for lunch, you know, and uh, I used to write to uh, Cameron Highlands for breakfast and we we're back home by lunchtime. Because that bike that I had was a ZZR Ninja 1100 CC 0 to 100 in 2.7 seconds, top speed 295 kilometers per hour. It was the world's fastest production motorcycle. So that group, small group of people uh, were the core of the people that, that I went with later on. Uh, if you want to go, then you must get to know this guy called Thomas Fu. He heads a, uh, he owns a shop, the Explorer shop in Publica. Yeah? He is the world's, uh, Malaysia's most travel man. He has a, he has a company called, a uh, website called 4x4worldexplorer.com. So I used to go with them. I ride my bike in front of them, and they drive their, their, their cars behind them. They carry my bag. So I got this group going, and uh, that's, how, that's how it is. You've got to get friends who are like-minded, you know. Don't just stay in the office until 8 o'clock. Go out and meet people, you know. Meet people with the same interests as yourself. Create a group, you know. That's what leaders are, are about, you know. You, 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 you want to do something, you find a way of doing it. You find people who are who share your, your your passion, you know. Like right now, for example, when I was working, I was always interested in photography. But when I stopped, I you know I volunteered to become a photographer, and eventually I became a very good photographer, good enough that after two years, Open University invited me to teach them photography. So you have to have a passion, and use that interest to get into an area that you want to get done. For example, for me, you know, I mean, I learned photography because I love photography. I offered my services. My services were good. So eventually that led me to being the unofficial free photographer for 12 years. So you have to find a group of friends, mix around. Don't just stay with your office group, you know. Your office group is, must be the, the most boring group of them all, you know. Everybody's out to stab each other. You know, that's what office politics is all about, you know. Everybody's try to, trying to climb on top of each other. You, you find this when you get to work. You know, now you're still young. Get to know people who share the same kind of passion as you. Go out, meet people. Yeah. Now there are seven, there are seven uh, factors actually, you know, how you can do what I want to do, like what I do. You know, number one is you have to have a bit of money. Right? So, why I told you that during your work phase of life, you have to think of your retirement and start a robust investment savings policy uh, or, or program so that you have enough income to, to spend. Okay? And number two is that you have to have a very compliant spouse. You know, if you have a wife that says you cannot go here, you cannot go there, then you can't go. Now, if you don't, if you have you don't have a compliant spouse, then you must have the, de the determination to tell her, I'm going anyway. <laughs> yeah. So three things. Huh? And number four, you must have some kind of a skill that you can exchange for whatever it is that you want done. Yeah. Number five, you must have a passion to do this thing so that you, you work hard at it. Yeah. And number six is the, this group of friends that um, you were talking about. You know? So these are some of the factors that you can get to do what you want to do. Yeah. Uh. Hello, Mr. Yusuf. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for your speech just now. Um, you really had my heart thumping with excitement. <laughs> okay, so I have so many questions for you, but I narrowed it down into like three very simple ones. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, have you, I mean, of course, you've been in uh, life-threatening situations, but can you share with us your most memorable one? And um, secondly, you spoke about plastic waste. So may I know your opinion on the zero, wa uh, zero straw motion that's going on right now? And um, finally, what application did you use to produce your slides? Because it looked very uh, interactive and interesting. Thank you. You know, when I was in, uh, in the Arctic Circle, you know, there's nobody there. There's only animals. And there are one or two islands around the place. And you know what we found on the beach of the islands? Plastic, fishermen nets, fishermen floats, polystyrene boxes, bottles, and they came with the tide all the way from maybe a thousand, two thousand 
kilometers away, you know. So plastic is the worst kind of a thing. And I, I regret, or rather I'm so sad that I was part of that problem. You know? But I, when I was working in the UK, I was selling polystyrenes, you know? styrenics, you know? styrenes, polystyrenes, expanded polystyrenes, that kind of thing, you know. And um, today, um, leadership must be responsible enough and forceful enough to prevent people from using plastics. For example, in the budget, I see no incentives for people to, uh, to be banned from using plastics, for example. You know? There's none. So what kind of leaders do we have? Yeah? So if you think plastics is bad for the environment, well, for goodness sakes, ban plastics. If you think smoking is bad for the environment, ban smoking. Why do you continue to allow smoking to be replaced by vaping, for example? Yeah? So we don't have forceful leadership to take us in the direction that you should go. Okay? So you talk about plastics, I think plastics are one of the worst things that has happened to us. Um, if you go and buy a, a, a rojak, for example, you know, they give you a plastic fork, they give you a plastic bag, you know, and they give you a plastic container for the sauce and that kind of thing. So just a little bit of roja, you generate maybe about 500 grams or nearly half a kilogram of pl plastic waste. And plastics cannot be, cannot be biodegradable. So you scientists, why don't you invent something that is biodegradable and replace plastic with something else? That's your responsibility. I've done my job. I've created the problem. Now we need the solution. And you are what? You, you, you are the people who are going to take us forward you know, in the future. You are the future leaders of tomorrow. Yeah? So what do you have in mind? How do you clear or solve this problem of environmental degradation and destruction? Put on your thinking caps. Your leaders. Hi. Um, my, my name is Nick Dura. I'm from Jiaotong University in China. Um, so thank you, first of all, thank you for Mr. Yusuf uh, for the wonderful speech. I'm super inspired. I really want to go traveling now. Um, so um, the journey that you've taken after your retirement is, um, in Mandarin, we would say, it's very not easy and it's not a simple um, decision. So is, there, um, is, this the thought, is this a thought or a decision that you've been thinking about your whole life or um, is there like a turning point in your life where you think, where you feel that, oh, okay, I want to do this after retirement. Thank you. I, I was lucky enough to have gone to the Royal Military College. Uh, I was one of the earliest uh, students there. And while we were there, you know, we lived as soldiers. Um, we had uh, any RMC people here, ah, <laughs> you know what it is like. <laughs> We, we live like, uh, we live an adventurous life. Yeah? Every uh, month we have a, a camp that we go to and then uh, we live like uh, military men, we uniforms, we live by the bell, we learn uh, survival tactics, we go camping, uh, you know, we go on expeditions and all that. So this sort of thing was already inside of me, you know, uh, at school age. So um, I suppose it comes naturally that uh, when I retired, and even during the time I was working, I was already, during my RMC days, I was, we were one of the first, in fact, the first to climb Gunung Korhu. And we didn't climb Gunung Tan because that time, Gunung Tan area was a, a black area where they had communist uh, terrorists there, you see? So we didn't climb Gunung Tan because of that, but we did climb Gunung Korhu when I was 14 years old. Yeah, so I suppose if, at this stage, you are only interested in playing computer games, you know, which is one. I tell you, the computer is both an asset and a curse, you know. I see my grandchildren after school, mm, you know, uh, PlayStation, that kind of thing, you know. During my time, we had no, no TV, you know, we had no TV, we read. How many of you read books? I wanted to show you uh, a, a picture of a book that I would suggest that you read because uh, I read it when I was 27 years old and it made a very uh, impactful um, thing on me, you know. Go and find Gail Sheehy, G-A-I-L-S-H-E-E-H-Y, Passages. It will speak more about what I was trying to tell you, that life is a series of passages, you know, that each passage has got a, a challenge, you know, it's got a, a characteristics. 
And if you understand this, and when you come, you're now in your turbulent twenties. You're just leaving the, the protection of your of your parents, uh, the uh, comfort of your siblings. And you're coming into the world. You are now finding new friends. You are getting into a new environment. You are about to stand on your own. You're trying to find your peer group. You're trying to find a partner for life. You might find something that's, uh, that's good for you. you know, you're trying to find a job. And then when you get married, in the 30s, for example, you have what we call the turbulent 30s. You decide or you suddenly uh, you know, discover that the, the person you chose as your partner has got these terrible habits and you know, maybe I made a mistake, you know, that kind of thing. And then you go on to your 40s. We call it the roaring 40s. For men, that's when the 7 year each or 20 year each starts. Uh, and then you go into your 50s. For women, you get menopause, you know, and you have many changes. And for men, there is men opos, you know, because men also go through these changes. But they never speak about it, you know, like Mahate has said, you know. We grew up together, we went to school together. You know, <laughs> but why must that thing die before I do? <laughs> you know, so there are these changes. Read Gail Sheehy Passages. She has since written another book, New Passages. And then she also wrote three or four other books, Menopause, you know, and Man Opos, that kind of thing. Gail Sheehy. The first book that she wrote, um, uh, Passages, you can actually uh, Google it. You can get it online as a PDF. Yeah? That thing changed my, my perception of life. At least it made me prepared. Um, it made me understand what each passage of life is and how you can prepare yourself to either take advantage of it or to guard against whatever the, the thing that's, that's uh, you know, that's that's bad about that, that passage. Read Gail Sheehy passages. It made a tremendous impact on me when I was in my 20s. I think it will do the same for you too. It was one of the most uh, uh, popular or well-read book and it's been translated into 27 languages. That's how good it was. Um, hello, Mr. Um, hello, sir. Um, uh, thank you for your delightful speech. It was very, I was very enjoying it. Um, there's been a talk about uh, legacy on your behalf, and that for some people, uh, legacy is uh, important to them. But in a world where seven billion people actually lived, not everyone can make an uh, impactful legacy on them. But everyone wants to make an impact on the world. And for uh, for your for your case. Um, how and when the, does it come to you that traveling is going to be my legacy, traveling is going to be my thing, um, and this is my legacy? So um, that would be my question. Thank you. Right. Um, just to uh, inform everyone, this is the last question, yeah? Thank you. I, I suppose um, um, it has to be in you, you know? It has to be in you. Traveling is so easy. When I was in, in college uh, during the holidays, we used to go hitchhiking, you know, from uh, where we were living in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur, in Taiping. We hitchhiked down to Kuala Lumpur. These days, you know, it's so easy for you to, to uh, you know, buy an in, uh, intra-Europe uh, train ticket and stay in bed and breakfast, in uh, Airbnb and all that. You know, or you can even go and camp. So you can travel very easily. So when I was in London, for example, I was working in London, Rotterdam, I never came back or holidays in Malaysia. Maybe three years, I come back once. Every time I get a vacation time, I take my family, put them into a motorhome, and I drive to Spain from London. I drive to, I drive to Austria. I drive to Moscow. I drive to Italy. So when you're studying abroad, don't just mix around with Malaysians. Mix around with the other races, the other uh, people around the world. Learn from them. Visit the country. I mean, if you meet a Czechoslovakian student, you know, why do you say, I would like to come to your country? And you can, in return, you can come to my country. You know, then that's the way. You know, you, you have to have this passion and put it into, into practice so that you, you move. Don't just sit down, mix only with Malaysians, go back every weekend, you know, get together with five Malaysians, cook your nasi lemak, you know. Go out, see the world, because the world is such a fantastic place. You know? You, you, you have to go out there, you know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't just stick around, right? Okay, thank you very much for, for listening to me.